Without further ado, we are about to bring in Sean Udell. You know him as Tech Trader. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. Uh, so yesterday, we saw some weakness in one of the spaces. Actually, a couple of the spaces you were warning about, and that being cloud. The sky was falling in. What's your takeaway now? The sky is falling in the cloud stocks. Um, we, you know, we could put a lot of puns here. You know, trees don't grow to the sky, although I'd say they were tickling the ionosphere with the cloud stocks. Um, yeah, well, there aren't any tree stocks, so we're going to stick with clouds and the sky is falling. So. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I put out a public tweet a few days ago. In fact, I think it was the night uh, Splunk and Workday reported. And I, and I said, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but I said something, this is a pretty close quote. I said, you know, just because a stock beats and raises doesn't mean the price goes up. And and I think that kind of says it all. I mean, I think, you know, that everything has a price. Every, everything has a price. Everything has a price on the downside. Everything has a price on the upside. I, I think, honestly, I think, I think sometimes people just, I don't know if they get over exuberant or if they, you know, worship the altar of momentum too much, or they just don't have uh, any root, any rooting in, in capability and fundamental analysis. But whatever the reason, there's probably a lot of reasons. I think people get um, they, they get swayed, and they get they get um, they get far too influenced by the price of a stock or the price of an asset. I mean, the one the one thing, and I, you know, by the way, I'm I'm just emotionally th thank God I'm built this way, but I'm. I, the price of things just doesn't affect me. Um, what I mean by that is the higher the price goes, that does not spur me to want to play in the game or buy the asset. That, that is a very common thing. I'm not saying that's better or worse. Uh, and I would say in a lot of things it does help one. one. Um, but, but most human beings are driven by a psychological need and in an evolutionary need, in fact, to to belong, to be in a crowd, to work cohesively as a group. Um, you know, I could get on a, on a whole long uh, diatribe of scientific study about why people do the things they do. But the, the fact of the matter is that the human species has evolved and proliferated and become extremely successful for one huge reason. It's because they collaborate with one another. Um, most primates don't collaborate very well. Um, and, and, you know, again, we could get into a big evolutionary study, but I'm not going to prolong this too much. But the human species, as a species, has done exceedingly well because they work in a cohesive unit. And they plan, and they, and they cooperate, and they, and they group think, and they think together. And that's one of the primary reasons that we, 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 are, we are where we are today. And we survived against mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and, and whatever, else, whatever other threats. Um, similar Cro-Magnon-type threats we probably had to face uh, way back when. But, but what that did is that created a mental framework for people that's, that's, for many, it's very hard to break. Um, and that mental framework might not be conducive to things like succeeding in financial endeavors. Um, because if you're, if you're prone to, to uh, not be contrarian, and again, I, I'd, I'd say the vast majority of people um, uh, think, think more like the, in, in the group type setting and, and cooperate very well, um, then that might not be conducive to successful investing over, over time. And I, I think it's, you know, I'm bringing this up because this is actually a very, mo a lot of people probably don't even realize why they think the way they think about certain things. Um, but, but if you're always wondering, geez, why, you know, why do I always chase these stocks that burn me? You know, why, why do I always sell stocks when they're super cheap and buy stocks when they're super high? Geez, why, why did I buy that condo in Sedona? you know, in 2006, when I knew I shouldn't have, you know, and I could have bought it four years later for one third the price. You know, damn, why did I, why did I pay 30 grand more for that limited edition Hellcat when I could have waited 18 months and, and bought it for 50,000 bucks cheaper, blah, 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 blah. I could go on and on and on, but the bottom line is 
you know, the way, the reason that many people fall into those traps is because it's, it's evolutionary design. All right. Well, so <laughs> now that we're talking, I bet you didn't think we we're talking and, going to talk about this today, did you? No. So I'm getting back to uh, <laughs> I'm getting back to Splunk and uh, what we're going to do with this one. So let's just talk about Splunk real quick, and then we'll talk about some of these other cloud names. So Splunk. This one has splattered. Uh, we're down in the one. Ooh, he sneaks in a splatter with the Splunk. Yeah. So. Uh, at what point uh, do we consider this maybe a value play? I mean, I, I know it's not close, um, but... We're, no, it's we're, not, not even close. Okay, okay, so it's not even on the reload ra radar. At, are you already short this one? No, Splunk is probably a name. So, so let's let's back up because, you know, we always we have old listeners and we always have new new listeners. So, 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 no, old listeners, sorry, just, you know, hey, excuse the rehash for 60 to... 75 seconds or 140 seconds but you know okay Splunk I was long focusless stock workday not sure it was ever focusless one of my favorite cloud stocks Coop owned it cheap Okta owned it cheap Twilio owned it cheap so probably every one of these names if I pan them uh, these were great names for me and I was long them before Mule got bought out by CRM I actually like Mule almost more than more than many of them um, so, so uh, CyberArk, uh, f former focusless stock, former long set was my favorite cybersecurity stock. Again, no, no longer have it. So, so again, if I pan these stocks now, I'm panning the price. I'm not panning the companies. These are all incredibly good companies, uh, and these are all companies that um, have helped me a lot personally because I was I was in them. I own them. I like them when they were cheap. So the um, so Splunk in particular. That's a fairly recent focus list removal. Um, you know, I can kind of look at Splunk both ways. The, the one thing I would say about Splunk is I would say they, their price performance to the upside on the stock has actually lagged their fundamental, um, their fundamental revenue growth. So in other words, if you, if you were in this stock at $28 a share in, in 2013, where I was, um, they traded much, much higher valuations than, than they do today. So simply put, they've grown revenues way, way faster than the stock price has, has grown. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't hate this. I just, I just think they're, they're better risk-reward setups. Um, at 126, is definitely better than it was at 140 after hours. And I, I know some people who were buying at 140 after hours. So, um, you know, I still like the stock a lot at 100. I think I think my last price target on the focus list when I removed it, I want to say, was 126. I'm going from memory because I'm not pulling it up right now. Uh, that seems about right. I, I think I think I had my price target in Splunk was 126. By the way, it was basically 126 when the stock was 56. So uh, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying I I don't. To me, the story hasn't changed a whole lot. The story on Splunk when it was fifty, sixty, seventy dollar stock is exactly the same story it is right now. The 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 results they're producing are pretty much expected. Again, a year, a year and a half ago, you could easily model out the growth and the, the revenues that Splunk is delivering. They beat, they beat, but but guess what? They almost always beat because they tend to beat and they tend to guide conservatively. It's one of the reasons I like the company long term. Um, you know, Palo Alto Networks is another one of these names we could throw in this mix. So I don't know. I'd have to see. I mean, I, you know, I always kind of do, I try to stay in the present with all this stuff. And I try to, I try to say, look, what, what has the best risk reward? What do I like? What's, you know, what, what do I like the setup of? Um, you know, I don't know what would be crazy. I mean, uh, hey, I, I know 80 to 84, I'd, I'd be long the stock. Um, that doesn't mean that I know that at uh, 118, I would be long, though. I don't know. I don't know. Is it, the, these are hard. Other people are better than me at kind of thinking because, to me, things aren't static. It's everything is relative to everything else, and the movement of everything else is very dynamic. So, so... The question on where I like Splunk again is very is dependent on literally hundreds of other stocks. Um, but, I, I, I mean, a real simple rule might be, I don't know, you could pay, basically draw a little trend line. The top of the clouds, about 110, 115. Uh, you know, a drop to 110 would be probably very excessive, given how good the report was. So 
something like that. I'm not calling for a drop to 110. I'm just saying that would get that would start tickling my fancy on the long side for sure. Again, relative to other things, I'd have to see where other stuff is trading. Could Splunk get to 110 without a severe market correction that takes loads of other names lower? I, I don't know. That's the one thing I don't know. But but let's say Ceteris Paribus, a Splunk's 110 in two weeks, I'm probably pretty interested in it. All right. Uh, why don't we touch on names like uh, CRM and Workday because they've had similar price action. Uh, any interest in these? A short pretend, uh, potential? No, I would probably say, well, maybe. You know, it, it, same thing. Workday is a hard name for me to short because literally is, is one of the names I think is absolutely best. The, the one, it's like Splunk. It's in its particular its particular vertical. It's the best name in the world. And by the way, I've had that view on Workdays pretty much since the IPO. So Workday continues to take a lot of share. Uh, I, I would say Workday got way out, way more out of, ahead of its skis than Splunk did, though. Workday at 200 is way more severely overbought and overhyped than Splunk at 140 was. Um, so I probably need a bigger pullback in Workday. I mean, by the way, you can, you can draw a very long-term trend line. You can pull up a weekly chart. By the way, we should do it. We should do a chart, a chart call again. We haven't done one of those in a long time. But if I, if I'm just, I'm just mentally looking at, you pull up it. You know, I don't know. You, you get a long-term trend line in a weekly chart. Still a very steep angle, by the way. Mm -hmm. But that connects to about 135 to 140. I'm not drawing. I just mentally kind of looked at it. Um, you know, a move down to there, it's, I wouldn't say that's outside the realm of possibility. Uh, this is, you know, again, people, this stock darn near doubled off the December low. That, that's a big move. And again, I wouldn't say that, that really anything has occurred that's been exceptionally surprising. Um, I don't know. Some people may disagree. I, I, I'm not a bit, I, am, I haven't been a bit surprised by anything Workday's done in six quarters. Very expected to me. So, the, but the stock was cheap. Stock was way cheaper six quarters ago. Um, so, but I like I say, I don't. I don't think any of these cloud reports this quarter have have been a surprise at all. So, um, so generally, when stocks go up, keep going up because of price momentum, they get more dangerous. Um, C CRM is probably, you know, some people call it the king of the cloud. Uh, CRM of the three is, is the name I, I guess I would least like. You, you talk about short. I'd rather short IGV. I'd rather short Adobe. I'd rather short Paycom, which I put a post on uh, just yesterday. Um, I, I'd probably rather short Vive. Uh, probably rather short MongoDB. So you know we're I don't I don't know if you get paid great on a on a CRM short. It's pretty stable. There's a lot of big money managers throw a lot of money at it. Pretty loved, pretty stable. You know their downturns tend to be mitigated. So I don't I don't know if that would be one of the names I would I would sort of favor on on the short side. You're talking and, about and IGV, Workday, you know, like the, the yeah, ETF. IGV is the an ETF mm -hmm. of basically cloud software. Now I, I like IGV more because IGV is loaded up with much lower growers. So you know names like like Adobe and Intuit and and uh, Autodesk. Auto, oh, like Autodesk, I think it'd be a better short. Honestly, though, you know I'm. I'm not doing a ton of shorts here. I, my, my mode, as the market has lifted a lot, you, you remember how, how aggressively sort of bearish I was last summer, fall, right? Mm -hmm. then, I, then I got extremely bullish November, December, especially into late December. Um, uh, you know, so, so basically, I guess I'm more interested in monetizing longs and raising cash from from staying long or increasing longs late last year than I am shorting. I also don't think I, I don't think the mar I don't think we've seen highs in the market. L last summer I felt much more confident if you remember, you know, I called for a very aggressive third correction. Uh, had a wait for it, was a little early. Uh, um, but I but I, I said numerous times that the third correction of 2018 would be the harshest one of the year. And boy, what, I mean, it, it, I mean, I thought we were going to get a thousand to eleven hundred points. I think I made that call with you on the air at least once. And what do we get? Two thousand points or something like that. Downside on the Nasdaq. So I, I don't, I don't really see a correction of that magnitude uh, in front of us near term. 
Um, so I, I guess I'd rather have cash and then reload longs. Um, or I'd read, and again, if you want to, if you want to talk about these names, it's fine. But I, I think Twitter, Baidu, um, are very safe, very high conviction longs for me. So, you know, I guess right now, I, I think I'd rather be long Twitter than short Autodesk. I think I'd be rather be long Baidu than short Autodesk. Um, I, you know, there's probably a few other names too, but but that's kind of where I am right now. Last summer. I, I would, I, you know, I liked being short things more than being long stuff I perceived was safer. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's the best way to explain it. All right. So the overall takeaway is not getting aggressive, short, any of these particular names. Uh, keep some dry powder and wait for potential pullbacks on names that you really do like. Yeah, I mean, if there was such a thing as perfect trading, I would have shorted. I, I would have shorted Workday at you know, two hundred or one ninety nine point nine. Um, but you know, I probably covered already. Uh, you know, I'd catch fifteen points or something like that. Probably would have covered it. Um, there's no such thing as perfect trading. Um, and again, I, st I still like a lot of my names. I mean, I still like. I still think the setup. I mean, I think the setup for Baidu is extraordinary, actually. Um, uh, you know, you got Chinese stocks heating up. You got a lot of spec Chinese stocks really heating up. I mean, I, I think Baidu is a very clearly the best large cap growth stump company in China, and it's, the stock hasn't gone done anything for four and a half, five years. And oh, by the way, they've doubled revenues over that more, maybe more than doubled revenues over that time. It's trading three times net cash plus investments. So I'd much rather be long Baidu than short various names. Um, so something like that is is more interesting, and I think there's could be a big catch up trade. Again, I think the Nasdaq goes higher. I do think again, I've been, kind of been a little bit wrong on this. Uh, we're starting to see some signs that maybe maybe the market's more willing to correct. Um, but I you know I still kind of think we need the I don't know 300, 400, 500, 600 point Nasdaq correction. Uh, and honestly, I don't want to buy a whole lot of stuff. Um, until we get that, at the same time, like I'm, I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to sell Baidu. I'm not going to sell Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sell any of my fiber optic stocks. At least, at least not more than ten or fifteen percent of them. Not going to sell any of my 5G stocks. So, um, and, and 5G fiber optics, I think, is going to clearly become, if it hasn't already, the leadership group in technology. All right. That sounds good. Let me get your take on Zscaler, though. We had one listener write in, and I've kind of gotten a lot of different opinions on this one. Uh, Zscaler, this one's had a pretty nice run, and now it's flirting with a uh, that gap higher. Um, and it could potentially break down and, and pull back into that gap zone. But what's your overall takeaway on Zscaler, ZS? You know, I... <laughs> I think I was long this, posted along this uh, quite a few months ago. Uh, had a, had a big move to the low 40s. I don't think I've done anything on it since then. Um, I mean, a hi hyper growth name currently. It won't. Hyper growth names can't maintain hyper growth rates. Trades 21 times sales out year. Trades 28 times sales currently. That does not fit my buy side discipline. Simple as that. So if the stock is 25 to 28 times sales, there's no way in hell I'm buying it. Uh, doesn't mean I'm going to short it, but but there's no way in hell I'm buying it. So, um, you know, hey, congrats to people who stayed long the name. Um, but but I can make just as much money and just as bigger returns. In fact, bigger returns, I think, in stocks that are cheaper. So, um, because cheaper stocks, not just price-wise, but valuation-wise, have, can have massive catch-up trades. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, it's, it's, it, it's a tough one. It's, uh, it, so sometimes the best thing to do is to sort of ignore them, at least for me, because, you know, it, it, it might look like the sauciest of shorts, and, and yeah, that could work, but, but you know, you, you can't, you don't want to get, you don't want to, you know, get run over by the steam, steam roller trying to pick up pennies in front of it. So, so I think that, uh, that that's just a tough one. I, I either want to see more chart aging on this. 
you know, I mean, here's the one thing I would say about them fundamentally. I'm not really seeing signs, and you've seen, you know, I've called peak earnings on things. I've called peak earnings on NVIDIA. I've called peak earnings on AOI. I've called, I've kind of called peak earnings on the whole fan group last year. Uh, I don't know if I, 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 I can't say that I have enough information or, or, or certainly any conviction to say that I see any material deceleration in Zscaler right now. So, so that, 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 that makes it a tougher short because if they keep producing these huge growth, growth, growth uh, beating quarters, it might, doesn't mean it's going to go up much from here because it's exceedingly expensive, but also might not make for, make for a very good short. You know, here's the one thing I'll say about CRM. CRM start, is starting to have second derivative deceleration. What that means is that the rate of growth is slowing. So they, a couple quarters ago, their billions was, I don't know, 26, 27, 28%, something like that. I think a quarter ago it was 25, 26 uh, Their billions growth was, was it 15%? I have to go look. Uh, maybe it was 22. Anyway, it was a de pretty decent deceleration of Billings growth. Now, the, billing, the headline Billings growth number still looks pretty good. But, like, that's something I can kind of sink my teeth into a little more. And, again, CRM, I've kind of just said it was a tougher short because it's a darling stock, a lot of fund institutional support. It's not as expensive. It's not crazily expensive. Um, but again, if it, you know if they start decelerating, they're going to have a hard time hanging on to price. Where so so I don't I don't know I don't I don't really uh, I don't see uh, there's no clear deceleration for for Zscaler. But again, I honestly kind of just ignore it. I mean, I look at the report, look at the numbers every quarter. But to me, it's kind of a do nothing. I'm not going to buy. It's way too expensive. But I don't really see a short there. All right, let's touch on a few of your more recent ads, and we'll start with PAYC. Your thoughts and where uh, you think this one's going next? Well, that that's a better example. Um, I mean, the the chart is definitely showing some signs of of at least fatigue, if not outright rolling over. Um, Honestly, this one kind of has been mysterious. Same thing. I wouldn't say that the last two reports were contained anything that that was surprising. This is a pretty expensive stock to begin with. To current, current, you know, 18, 18x sales out years probably like fourteen, fifteen. Um, you know, this this is not uh, this isn't a fifty five or sixty or seventy percent grower. I mean, this is a thirty percent grower. You know, I'd remind people like okay my redfin um uh, again not the same space but utilizes technology utilizes ai utilizes tons of great technology inputs and is growing 30 percent and you know th th isn't even sniffing four times sales so so you know um so so, so that's kind of how i how i line up paycom is that uh, you know, it was a relatively expensive stock at 125, and at 180, it's just that much more expensive. So again, not taking anything away. Very good company, have, have grown nicely, but trees don't grow to the sky, and I think this one's kind of tickling the ionosphere. So, so I think this one's set up pretty good. Um, and 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 I don't know. Sometimes I kind of just spot things. Um, you know, th this this sort of reminds me of Veronis and New Relic last year before I shorted them. So then maybe those stocks weren't like stocks that everybody knew, but they were relatively popular. But again, kind of the same thesis, just just got you know really expensive based on fundamentals. Fundamentals are good. Not saying the company is going to go away. Not saying they do anything wrong. Just get get way too expensive. Again, I think there's just way too many people chasing momentum. I mean, the the, the one thing you can almost say, I mean, theoretically. If, if I'm right on Paycom, I'm probably going to be right on the whole space because it's basically a group trade, right? So, so if I'm wrong on Paycom, I'm not that worried about it because that probably means like my longs will go up just as much as Paycom. But if I but if I'm right on Paycom, I probably could have shorted 15 cloud stocks because if Paycom drops 20 20 percent, but you know my guess is the group probably drops 10 to 15 percent, right? However, I do think Paycom has has more potential to drop more, given some things I see. Again, high, very, very high valuation metrics and things like that. Um, again, it's not as expensive as Zscaler, but Zscaler's got twice its growth. 
So, so I, I think as, as I line up Paycom and a few other names like it, again, there's, there's lots of things I have in my short, my short potential book. Um, you know, Autodesk is probably the one I missed, by the way. I mean, I, that, that was probably the easiest short post report, like literally after hours or the pre-report. Pre uh, didn't do it. Uh, you know, I'm kind of there already because I'm, I'm, I'm a willing shorter of IGV. Um, and that's one of their top ten holdings of that. But but I, I I almost think an Autodesk sets up better, but but not necessarily better in Paycom, but better in a lot of other things. But again, let let's focus this back to if this works, it works. It's likely a group trade, and you probably could short twenty different cloud names and they'll all go down. That that's my best guess of 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 how the group trades. All right, let's touch on a few names that you just recently either added to or bought uh, well well after the uh, big drop, after an earnings play. So we'll start with VICR. You went in on this one a little bit before the earnings. I think we had a call. You liked it ahead of the print, and then uh, this one dropped down to that $31 area. You added to it, and you said you would incrementally add to it uh, every dollar or two lower or so so you're at about what a half size position in this one right now vic if that a third yeah third to half probably um might be close to half i'm probably i don't know somewhere probably between third and a half um you know th this is not uh th to me this is like the antithesis of the cloud trade right now so so vicor you know again they haven't gone up with semiconductor rally and um, they certainly haven't gone up with the cloud rally it is an AI name. It's an AI play. They kind of went up with the AI group trade before. Uh, the reason being, they sell they sell uh, their their gear into AI uh, facilitators like Nvidia. Um, here, here's why. Here's what I like best. I think I put this out post report. What I like best about this, I think it sets up just like MTSI. By the way, I like MTSI better. I like IIVA VI better. I like Acacia better. So the, the, you know, this is not a a key name for me. It'll probably never be in the focus list. But hey, I think it's a relatively well valued semiconductor name. It's 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 not dirt cheap like it was. I wish I'd have known about this, or I wish I would have sort of paid attention to myself. Because I have followed this name for a while, I didn't do anything on it when it was like I don't know, twelve to twenty. Um, but it's a good good pullback from 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 very very big spike highs of you know roughly six months eight months ago. Um, you know I can support a valuation of this that's quite a bit higher. Um, this one's a little tricky, you know, just so everybody knows. There's no analyst coverage. Uh, the briefing, in fact, I would say briefing.com has no coverage. Wow. No, no analyst coverage. Now, it's interesting because if you listen to the calls, there's several se industry semiconductor analysts on the calls. But for whatever reason, they don't cover the stock. So I don't know if they're covering the stock as a potential name they might cover or if they're getting clues to 48 volt in the, the space, this particular you know power semiconductor space it's in, which would be like Maxim and Powy and M Power and names like that, and in uh, you know, so stuff like that. So so, but yeah, it's kind of weird because there are some. There's definitely in industry analysts that ask them questions on a call, but there's no coverage. So I, I, again, I'm kind of tooting, touting briefing.com's coverage. I mean, really, of any of any industry group or any any company, industry company based in this in, in financial publication, I, I don't know of anybody else that has had good coverage on Vicor except briefing. And uh, I've talked about it a little. Some other guys, Robert Reed's talked about it probably the most. Although I don't know if he's put much out on it recently. Um, but again, hey, brief, briefing was on this way cheaper. Um, you know, I, I sort of missed the the first time. Uh, it, it, it moved, and then the next time it had such a huge gap. I don't I, was it like an eighteen dollar gap? It was a, there was some massive gap that I'm like, no, there's no way I'm chasing that gap, um, and that served me well because that that gap was unsustainable on the stock. But no, I mean, like I say, I think I think if they're my, my I'm modeling that they can do about. Uh, well, let me just pull it up. I I won't guess. I'll just say my number. Um, give me two seconds. Spreadsheet's pretty large. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm modeling that they can do 350 million uh, out year. I think they'll do about 280 this year. Um, you know, if, if, if they trade at a, at a even five, six times sales that, 
you know, that gets them back at least to the prior high, not the all-time highs, but that, you know, that $45 to $48 high. Um, that would be about five times uh, out here. Uh, that's not dirt cheap for a semi, but that, interestingly, that is pretty cheap for power semiconductor companies. Yeah, I think Powy and Mpower trade quite a bit higher than that. Um, Sem Semtech is another name that's in that group. That would be kind of in line with them. Um, and uh, uh, there's one of these that trades at a crazy valuation. I think it's I think it's Mpower. I, I was I was surprised how expensive Mpower was. Um, yeah, it is Mpower. I mean, Mpower is currently trading like 10, 11 times sales right now. Um, not sure that's sustainable, but assuming that is, Bicor is cheap relative to to Mpower. Um, I you know I would say that the bigger companies if you know deserve probably deserve some premium because they can meet huge production quotas and things like that. You know, Vicor has to ramp up production. Um, but, you know, they, they can produce enough to meet, meet uh, let, let's call it the high end of the market, meet their customer needs and things like that. So, by the way, I, you know, if anybody wants to listen to an interesting call, it's an interesting call. Uh, they don't sound too worried to me. Um, they sound pretty confident. They seem to like their technology. Um, so we'll see. I mean, again, I, I you know, I kind of hope that I can buy some of this between 28 to 30, if not even lower, because um, it's still, it's not as cheap as I personally like to buy semiconductor companies. I, I don't love paying, you know, five times sales or whatever for them. I, I, I'd rather pay one and a half to three times sales. I mean, that's where I bought Sina. That's where I bought Micron. But different semiconductors trade at different valuations, so you have to, you know, you can't you can't paint the whole semi group with the same valuation brush. All right, and let's talk about another new ad. Actually, I don't think you had a position on uh, after the move here, but this one is in Nutanix. Um, I think it even dropped a little lower from where you got in. It's currently trading below the thirty-four dollar threshold. What's your takeaway on this one, and where do you see a price target? Well, so so I had I had completely got out of this name um, and been out for quite some time. This was a huge this was a huge 2017 winner of mine. People can go back and read read it. That had a bunch of posts on it. By the way, I was catching a lot of heat on this name. I remember. I, remember, I mean, you know, I, I started buying at probably low twenties. Can't remember my exact sort of initial initial buy. Uh, but man, the more the lower it went, the just I, I got basically semi giddy on this thing because I just thought everybody had completely missed the mark on it. Then you know what? Turns out I was right. I mean, it, it, like I have no idea how anybody sold the stock at fifteen bucks. I mean, fifteen dollars. This thing was trading. Now this is this is back too when they were a much much stronger grower than they are now. You know, this is their you know this is the post IPO growth honeymoon phase, right? And um, you know, I think they had two things. They had a very minor miss. They had a very minor earnings miss. It wasn't even that bad, but it was minor. And they had uh, IPO lockup expiry. And the combination of the two, and the two hit with literally within like days of each other, probably probably two days of each other. Like I think they had that minor miss, and two days later they had the lockup expiry. Uh, boom, Th thing goes from you know 30 to 15. I didn't like it at 30, but I, but I, I think I like I said, I think I started nibbling low 20s. Uh, and I pretty much bought this down two two dollar increments. Bought it, bought it, bought it, bought it. it was a large position. It was top five top five position of mine personally at one point. And then, you know, I made two to three X on it and got out. And, and yeah, I mean, same thing. I kind of caught heat at the lows. I kind of I kind of caught heat at the highs because, yeah, I wasn't in at the highs. I missed, I don't know how many points, but I don't know. You make two or three X. It's not too bad. Um, you know, I'd like to do that on every name for the rest of my life. I never have to worry about anything. So uh, I had a tiny little, I put a tiny little bit on, a bit on this pre-print. Uh, now that could be a mistake, but sometimes I just got to have a little something because if I have a little something, it just makes it easier to trade the position. I don't know if other people can identify with that, but if but if something is completely clean off my sheets, and and then you and then it goes down a lot, it's really easy to say, oh hey, look how smart I was. I avoided I avoided this drop, and then you're and then you you know thirty four is cheap, which I think I bought thirty four. You know thirty four is cheap. But but you're like you know what wouldn't 32 be better? Okay then then it, then it goes to 32. But but you don't buy it. And then you're like man so look how smart I am. Look how smart I am. I got out of this stock. I avoided this. 
Okay, but then you don't buy 32. And you're like, well, you know, would 30 be really great? So in other words, you start getting prices that you know are stupid, you know are way below fundamental, fundamentally great buys, but you just don't buy it. Because why? Because you don't have any. And I don't know, just it's easier for me to buy something if I already have a little bit of it. And um, no, I like it. I, I wouldn't put it back. I wouldn't put it in the Twitter, Redfin, Baidu, Spotify, Qualcomm camp, you know, names I really, really like. Um, but you know what? I like it. I like, I like Nutanix. I mean, I think this will be a feature stock of mine again for a while. I don't know where it settles. I, I could see people getting really concerned about it. Uh, by the way, they had a great quarter. They just guided poorly. Now, some people, I, like I have some pretty good friends in the software space, and they're just like, oh, God, that is such a bad reason they gave. Now, Jim, I don't know if you know that. There's, so the reason they gave for the guide was that they, they, they were kind of cruising along really nicely and was, were, was able to save money not putting money into marketing. And so they went for quite a few quarters without putting as much money into marketing, specifically for like lead generation, I think they said. And, um, and oh, by, oh, by the way, uh, they realized just recently that, oh, man, we're really shy in our lead generation expenditures, and we got to start ramping that up again, and that's why they're guided lower. Honestly, that sounds fine to me. I mean, you know, like I say, I have some buddies in the space that they're like me. They've been analyzing software companies for 10 or 15 years. They hated that reasoning. I'm like, I don't know. I, I work for I work for companies in tech. I know how they can move their spending budgets around. I know how badly they can screw up. They can get again. They get they get uh, they get overconfident. They start thinking, hey, this product's selling itself. We don't need to spend as much money on marketing. We don't need to spend as much money as you know, for our sales team to go do junkets for people and blah blah blah. Oh, by the way, three quarters later, boom, they miss. I've been there. I've worked directly for companies like that. So, so I don't think that explanation is nearly as bad as other people think it is. I think, uh, it, by the way, it's not that dissimilar to what caused their first hiccup. It was something similar. I'd have to go back and look. I mean, this was back in early 2017. But I think it was sort of the same issue. I think they were kind of underspending for, uh, you know, for, I don't know if it was lead gen, but I think they were kind of understanding for sales and marketing. And uh, again, it was a very minor hiccup. I mean, the most beautiful thing about buying that stock between 20 and 15 back then was it didn't affect growth that much. Uh, this did affect guidance quite a bit. But, you know, these guys kind of guide conservatively too. This could be a kitchen sink guide. I don't think this will be a long thing. Again, I like it. I like it. I don't. I don't love it. I don't love it as much as I once did. But remember, I wasn't buying Nutanix at 35. I was buying it between 15 and 20. So it's hard for me to like a stock at 34 as much as I liked it at 15. Um, but you know, they've had a couple years to age. I don't know. I like it. I think. But put it this way, it's very well valued relative to the rest of the space that they're in now. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I hope to build it up cheaper. I don't know where where they settle. Here's here's the problem. We haven't had much of a market correction. So is Nut does Nutanix hold 34 if the Nasdaq's 400 points lower than it is today? I don't know. I would say it probably goes lower. So that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping the Nasdaq finally corrects, and then I'm you know Nutanix will be wherever it is when the Nasdaq's at 7100, and I can buy more there. All right, and just to circle back on Baidu, now I don't necessarily know the bear case on Baidu, but this is coming from a listener, and the listener asks, if you're concerned uh, with Baidu increasing their spending a lot and lower margins, and he states that that seems to be what the bears are saying about Baidu. Is that the reason it was down? If that's the reason, I love that. Um, well, boy, I don't know that if that's was the reason, reason it's down, but uh, I'm No, no, if that's just the reason, the he message. might be right. Well, so let me continue the thought. Okay, that was the reason that they didn't like Google at 600 pre-split. So relative to that, Google's gone from 300 to 1100. Now, that was also the reason they didn't like Facebook at, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 20. Um, that was probably the reason they didn't like Yelp at one point when it was, you know, half or one quarter of its current price. That was probably the reason they didn't like Zillow when it was an 18 or $20 stock. So I could go on and on and on. I, I, honestly, I don't know. If that's the reason, that's nirvana to me. A big tech company should be spending. 
they should spend, they should spend, they should spend on R&D, they should develop new products, they should grow revenue streams, they should, they should dominate their current industries. Um, by the way, that's what Baidu's done. I mean, uh, that, by the way, that might be the bear case. Honestly, I don't really, but here's my, here's what I think the bear case is. It's not a winning stock right now. It's, you know, for whatever reason, the stock hasn't done, you know, it was, if you would have bought the stock five years ago, you probably paid 60 points higher than you paid, than you can pay today. In many people's minds, that's bad. In my mind, that's awesome. Because I like to buy stocks way cheaper after they doubled their revenues. So other people think that's bad. They, they, they think a, ch a chart in the lower right corner is bad. They'd rather buy Workday at 200. I'm not that way. I'd rather buy Baidu at 161 than Workday at 200. So I, I, I'd say that I'd say that success that's the, the success of that is 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 uh, you know over time un, unarguable. But hey, that's the theme. That's that's what everybody believes now. They believe that you got to buy these charts in the upper right corner. You know, a good chart equals a good company. A higher stock price equals an ever higher stock price. That's not my game. I don't believe that. I think history proves me proves proves me right. Um, and I think Baidu is going to be a huge winner. I think th th this has become like literally one of my favorite stocks pretty quickly. Um, honestly, kind of like you know, I used to own Baidu. I, Baidu used to be a very good. In fact, when I owned Google years ago, I, I owned Baidu. Um, and you know, I served very well. I didn't. I didn't like it at the highs in fourteen, fifteen. I didn't like it at the highs in sixteen, seventeen. Uh, I didn't think it was expensive, though. The one thing I can say, even when I didn't like Baidu at prices where other people was ch were chasing the stock, I, it wasn't expensive. It's not a challenging stock on valuation. Even at highs three or four years ago, it was not a challenging stock. On valuation, things is extremely undervalued now. So just so you know, when I say three times cash and in investments, it is three times net cash and in investments. So that's netting the debt against all the cash, long-term investments. You also have to add up investments that they have. They own like they own big stakes and and companies like IQ and things like that. So you got to you got to add um, those stakes in. Um, but but even if you just purely look on the balance sheet, it's probably four times net cash and investments that you can find on the balance sheet. The IQ, you have to do some work to get all their all the investments that they own. Um, but now, I, I mean, th this one is like again. I think this is going to be one of my no-brainers. I think this is going to be like a Micron that I was buying at ten to fourteen that everybody hated. I think this is going to be like an Apple in two thousand thirteen that everybody hated. Um, I think this is going to be like a Nutanix 15 to 20. Um, I don't think this is going to be like Pi, which I still have a loss in. I don't, I don't think this is going to be like uh, FireEye, which I've, which I've lugged around for two or three or four years. And some of my FireEye is profitable, but about half the position is not. Um, Bayou is a pretty good name. It's pretty, I mean, I would arguably say it's, this, and I don't think there's much debate. I think it's the best large cap growth company in China. So the question is, why is it trading so cheap? Well, you know, Apple's traded cheap, Google's traded cheap, Facebook traded dirt cheap at one point. You know, great companies can trade very cheaply. I think I think that's just the, you know, I think it's the bare case is that it's got a bad chart. And I don't think those things are sustainable very long. All right. Well, let's leave it on that note. And I think Tech T, like you said, now that earnings season or season is out of the way, we can probably do a a rapid fire trade segment, uh, you know, tr trading chart segment uh, on our next uh, visit, which will probably be next week. So we'll look forward to that and we'll advertise it a little bit and see if there are some uh, listeners out there who want their charts analyzed by Tech T. As always, my friend, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. All Go right. by, do. All right. There you go. Later. All right. Thanks, Sean.